monitors are up we're all ready to go oh, there we go. hey here we go we're here okay we're here hey uh good evening everybody welcome back to our uh, sunday night offering of astronomy outreach the sunday night astronomy show my name is chris from astronomy by the bay and first of all i'd like to welcome back our two regular co-hosts uh, royal astronomical society of canada member mr paul owen from the beautiful dark skies of hampton new brunswick dark and cloudy tonight hey paul hello evening and Royal Astronomical Society of Canada member, Mr. Mike Powell from the PFO Observatory here in St. John. Hey, Mike. Hey. I'm not sure where he is from my perspective, so I'm doing this. <laughs> that, that works. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure where I am from your perspective. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Here we go. All right. Uh, so on tonight's program, um, we're all uh, looking forward to nice weather and an opportunity to relieve some stress, for sure, uh, during these COVID times and everything, uh, and perhaps spend some time underneath the starry sky. Uh, well, no matter what gear you're using, you want to be sure that everything is in great working order uh, before you start. So tonight we'll be talking a little bit about uh, some of that equipment and how to get it in top shape before you head out under the stars and mostly about collimation. Um, also on tonight's show, Mike's going to be offering uh, another one of our uh, new segments, uh, his binocular target of the week. Uh, we'll also have, <laughs> we'll also have uh, another segment of the Where Are They Now? Uh, segment that we've started uh, to replace uh, our What's Up in Space topic. And that's a look at past and present missions. And tonight's presentation is going to be about the amazing little helicopter on Mars right now, Ingenuity, and uh, what's expected to happen. Um, I guess it was going to happen today, but it looks like it's going to be Thursday now before things take off. And Paul's going to offer us another interesting Rosanna's Fun Fact segment as well tonight. And uh, we'll take a look at your photos. And, of course, we'll take uh, all your questions about telescopes, stargazing, and more. So sit back and enjoy. Remember, this is a family-friendly live broadcast. So if you have any questions about the night sky, we're happy to try and answer them here for you. So let's get started with our, uh, I guess we'll go back to uh, where are they now. All right. All right. So that's me. Uh, good evening, everybody, on Facebook and YouTube. Thanks for joining us. Okay, let's get started here with uh, this one. It's going to take a little bit of time to talk about because there's a fair amount of information. I didn't realize there was this much going on with ingenuity, but uh, let's see if I can get this up and going here. So I'm going to first of all present now my entire screen. And then I'm going to go with this one. And let's see if this works. Sometimes you have to do something just to show that you can do it. When the Wright brothers flew for the first time, they flew an experimental aircraft. And in the same way, the Mars helicopter is designed to show that we can fly powered helicopter flight in the Martian atmosphere. You guys able to hear that? Hello, guys? <clears throat> no, I can't hear it. You can't hear it? From but day they might, this was the unwavering let me just check aim Facebook. of our team to get our helicopter. Yeah, they can hear it on Facebook. Mars, okay, yep. So that we can get the opportunity to do that very first rotorcraft flight test in the actual environment of Mars. You can't hear it? It's extremely difficult to fly at Mars because the atmosphere is so thin. Compared to Earth, at Mars it's less than 1%. So the first and foremost challenge is to make a vehicle that's light enough to be lifted. And then the second is to generate lift. The rotor system has just been very fast. 2,000, 2,400, 2,600. We're spinning between 2,000 and 3,000 revolutions per minute, and it takes a lot of energy. So it's that balance of a very light system, yet having enough energy that's needed to you know, spin the rotor so fast to lift, and on top of it, having to design in the autonomy. It has to be fully autonomous from the time it takes off to the time it lands. What we do do on the ground is we plan the flights, and so we determine from here where we want the helicopter to go. Our experiment window is 30 Martian days. So we have planned uh, up to five flights of incremental difficulty. 
the very first flight, the main thing is we want to get the legs off the ground. And so we will basically go up uh, about three meters and we'll hover there uh, and then we'll come down again. And that will be the first, you know, really major milestone. Most of our flights will be at the three to five meter height. We will be going horizontally again at a few meters per second, probably go out, you know, 50, 70 meters and come back. In successive flights, we'll probably push that further, try to go further. So our priority will be to get back engineering telemetry and not so much images, but I'm sure we'll return a few, you know, because they'll always look cool. At this point, we've tested all we can on Earth. We have mathematical models that shows how it will fly at Mars, and we've tested it in the simulated environment that we can create on Earth. It really is time now to do the Audio and video aren't the uh, seeking, sorry. At Mars. Nothing is a given, but we have done everything we can in terms of a test program here on Earth. The vehicle is performing extremely well so far. It's been doing exactly the right thing, even right now when it's bolted onto the Perseverance rover. So there's a very good chance that we'll pull it off, yes. But it's still high risk and none of us forget that you could have a glitch that, you know, could mean end of mission, yes. It's going to be exciting, reacting to any surprises we have. We can't wait. <laughs> What's really most important is everything we're learning here is for the future rotorcraft systems that we want to introduce into space exploration. And audio and video, just a little bit of a sync there. Sorry about that. So let's go back. Okay, um, I'm going to continue on with the presentation part, if I can. That's just a little lead in uh, to where we're going. And here we are. So this is the Where Are They Now segment of the show. These are all the spacecraft that are out there, past, present, and future, mostly past and present. And of course, tonight we're going to be talking uh, about uh, Mars Ingenuity hel Helicopter. So Ingenuity is, is what is known as a technology demonstration, a, pro a project that seeks to test a new capability for the first time with limited scope. The Mars Helicopter is a high-risk, high-reward demonstration. If Ingenuity were to encounter difficulties during its 30 sol Martian Day mission, it would not impact the science gathering at all of NASA's Perseverance Mars rover mission. Now, previous groundbreaking technology demonstrations included the Mars Pathfinder Sojourner rover and the, t the tiny Mars Cube 1 sats that flew back uh, in 2018. Now, flying in a controlled manner on, Mar on Mars is far more difficult than flying on Earth. Even though gravity on Mars is about one third that of Earth's gravity, the helicopter must fly with the assistance of an atmosphere whose pressure at the surface is only 1% that of Earth. Uh, if successful, engineers will gain invaluable in-flight data at Mars for comparison to the modeling, simulations, and tests performed back here on Earth. NASA will also gain its first hands-on experience operating a, ro a rotocraft remotely at Mars. Now, these data, data sets will be invaluable for potential future Mars missions that could enlist next generation helicopters to add an aerial dimension to their explorations. The first flight will be autonomous, <coughs> excuse me, with Ingenuity's guidance, navigation and control systems doing all the piloting. That's mostly because radio signals will take 15 minutes and 27 seconds to bridge the 278 million kilometer gap between Mars and Earth. It's also because just about everything about the red planet is very demanding. Now, Ingenuity, uh, I'll be sure where I am on my slides, sorry. This is actually a selfie taken by uh, the Mars Perseverance rover. Looking back and then going ahead. And <clears throat> We're on slide number seven. Yeah, okay. Ingenuity is intended to demonstrate technologies needed for flying in the Martian atmosphere. If successful, these technologies could enable other advanced robotic flying vehicles that might be included in future robotic and human missions to Mars. They could offer a unique viewpoint not provided by current orbiters high overhead or by rovers and landers on the ground, providing high definition images and re reconnaissance for robots or humans and enable access to terrain that is very difficult for the rovers to reach. I see him looking at it and taking, looking back at us. Anyway, in careful steps from 2014 to 2019, engineers at JPL demonstrated that it was possible to build an aircraft that was lightweight, able to generate enough lift 
uh, in Mars thin atmosphere and capable of surviving in a Mars-like environment. Uh, they tested <clears throat> progressively more advanced models in special space simulators at JPL. And in January 2019, the actual helicopter that is riding with Perseverance to the Red Planet passed its final flight evaluation, and uh, failing any one of these milestones would have grounded the experiment. So uh, given the first uh, flight uh, Ingenuity is trying to accomplish, the team had a long list of milestones they needed to pass before the helicopter can could take off and land in the spring of 2021. Uh, the team will celebrate each time they meet one, and uh, they did, of course, with the milestones included. Uh, one of them was, of course, surviving the launch from Cape Canaveral, the cruise to Mars, and landing on the Red Planet. Now, safely deploying to the surface from Perseverance's belly. Of course, this is the uh, these, these are the uh, videos that were captured, uh, still shots, and that videos of, as well. A parachute uh, there with the rover coming down. One looking up at the parachute, one looking down at the rover. And there it is under the belly of the rover, all tucked in nicely. And there it is the, when the they dropped the cap off, the protective cap covering, and the uh, Ingenuity is sitting up in here. <coughs> Looks like an oil pan. Yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's what they used. <laughs> Those $85 million helicopters are probably didn't use an oil pan, but it looks a lot <laughs> like it. So uh, autonomously uh, keeping warm, to, um, sa or safely deploying from, uh, from Perseverance's belly, and then autonomously keeping warm through the intensely cold Martian nights, and autonomously also charging itself with its solar panels. Apparently already the solar panels are getting covered with dust. But that should disappear once it starts uh, in flight. And then Ingenuity would make its first flight attempt. Uh, if the helicopter succeeds in that first flight, uh, the Ingenuity team will attempt uh, up to four other test flights within the 30 Martian day or 31 Earth day window. If in Ingenuity succeeds, future Mars exploration could include ambitious aerial di dimensions. Now, what makes it hard to f uh, for a helicopter to fly on Mars? For, for one thing, Mars thin atmosphere makes it difficult to achieve enough lift. Because Mars' atmosphere is 99% less dense than Earth's, Ingenuity has to be light, with rotor blades that are much larger and spin much faster than what they would be required for a helicopter of the Ingenuity's mass on Earth. It can also be bone-chillingly cold at Jezero Crater, where Perseverance landed with Ingenuity attached to its belly. Nights there dip down to below minus 90 degrees Celsius. While Ingenuity's team on Earth had tested the helicopter at Martian temperatures and believe uh, it should work on Mars as intended, the cold will push the design limits of many of Ingenuity's parts. Now, in addition, flight controllers at JPL won't be able to control the helicopter with a joystick. Communication delays are an inher inherent part of working with spacecraft across interplanetary distances. Commands will need to be sent well in advance with engineering data coming back from the spacecraft long after each flight takes place. In the meantime, Ingenuity will have a lot of autonomy to make its own decisions about how to fly uh, to a certain waypoint and keep itself warm. Ingenuity features four specially made carbon fiber blades arranged in two rotors that spin in opposite directions at around 2400 RPM, many times faster than a passenger helicopter on Earth. It also has innovative solar cells, batteries, and other components Ingenuity doesn't carry science instruments at all and is a separate experiment from the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover. Remember, it's just a test to see if it, it can actually happen. Now, this is a little bit of a video. Event, events leading up to the first flight test begin when Perseverance rover, which serves as a communications base for Ingenuity, receives the day's instructions from Earth. Now, those commands will have traveled from mission controllers at JPL through NASA's Deep Space Network, and I just want to find that uh, over here. I'm going to try to turn that down just a little bit. Um, to a receiving antenna aboard Perseverance. Now parked some 65 meters away, the rover will transmit the commands to the helicopter about an hour later. Now when it is time, Ingenuity will begin undergoing its myriad pre-flight checks. The helicopter will repeat the blade wiggle test it performed three days prior. If the algorithms run, running the guidance, navigation, and control systems deem the test results acceptable, they will turn on the inertial measurement unit, uh, which is an electronic device that measures the vehicle's orientation and rotation, 
and inclinometer. Uh, if everything checks out, the helicopter will again adjust the pitch of its rotor blades, configuring them so they don't produce lift during the first early portion of the spin-up. Then the spin-up of the rotor blades will take about 12 seconds to go from 0 to 2537 RPMs, the optimal speed for the first flight. Uh, after a final systems check, the pitch of the rotor blades will be commanded to change yet again, this time so they can dig into those few molecules of carbon dioxide, nitrogen and argon available in the atmosphere near the Martian surface. Moments later, the first experimental flight test on another planet will begin. Now, it should take about 6 seconds to climb to the maximum height for this first flight. When it reaches 3 meters, Ingenuity will go into a hover that should last, if all goes well, for about 30 seconds. While hovering, the helicopter's navigation camera and laser altimeter will feed information into the navigation computer to ensure Ingenuity remains not only level, but in the middle of its 10 by 10 meter airfield. A patch of Martian real estate uh, chosen for its flatness and lack of obstructions. Then the Mars helicopter will descend and touch back down on the surface of Jezero Crater, sending back data to Earth via Perseverance to confirm the flight. Now, of course, this is showing one of the future flights after it has uh, gone up just vertically and landed again. Perseverance is expected to obtain imagery of the flight using its nav cam and mass cam imagers, with the pictures expected to come down that evening, now early morning Thursday, April 15th, in Southern California. Now, the helicopter will also document the flight from its perspective with a color image and several low resolution black and white navigation pictures possibly being available by the next morning. Now, the, the Wright brothers only had a handful of eyewitnesses to their first flight, but the historic moment was thankfully captured in a great photograph. Now, 117 years later, we are able to provide a wonderful opportunity to share the results of the first attempt at powered controlled flight on another world via our robotic photographers on Mars. And I'm just trying to get to the uh, closing part here. Pardon me for a second. There we go. Okay, an update. So based on data, of course, this was supposed to happen this morning at around 11... Uh, 11.30 um, Eastern Time, uh, but based on the data from Ingenuity Mars helicopter that arrived late Friday night, NASA has chosen to reschedule the Ingenuity Mars helicopter's first experimental flight to no earlier than April the 14th, which is Thursday. During a high-speed spin test of the rotors on Friday, um, the command sequence controlling the test ended uh, early due to a watchdog timer expiration. This occurred as it was trying to transition the flight computer from pre-flight to flight mode. The helicopter is safe and healthy and communicated its full telemetry back to Earth. Now, the watchdog timer oversees the command sequence and alerts the system to any potential issues. It helps the system stay safe by not proceeding if an issue is observed and worked as planned. The helicopter team is reviewing the, tel the, the, the uh, telemetry to diagnose and understand the issue. And following that, they will reschedule the full speed test. And understand that this little helicopter uh, and its design cost $85 million. So if it takes them an extra few days to get things right, no problem. I'm good with that. <laughs> and uh, that's everything we know about the Ingenuity helicopter for now. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> That's quite a craft, you know. Isn't it, huh? When you think about everything that they had to do there to get that thing up there, first of all, and then to figure out or try to uh, estimate what the what the, the, the whole uh, atmosphere is going to be like to fly that thing. Because, I mean, really, until you're actually doing it, you truly don't know what you're dealing with. Okay, absolutely. Like it's going to be, uh, it'll be an amazing feat. I mean, this is the first time we've flown on another world. And if it does take off and it does do well, the, this, this technology demonstration, um, all it is really is a demonstration flight. Um, they're going to try four or five more flights uh, in the next 30 days, each one going farther and farther out coming back. But it'll be looking down on the rover while the ro rover's looking up at it at the same time. Hopefully you won't see yeah. this laser beam going up and shooting the, <laughs> <laughs> shooting the ingenuity. But uh, the thing is that they'll be using this technology for later missions, uh, possibly even on Titan, uh, one of Saturn's moons, um, maybe our, um, maybe in other areas as well. But for Mars, for sure, as we start to send more craft out there, uh, they may yeah. want to scout out areas that, that will send rovers to and, and that kind of thing. So, yeah, it's quite, it's quite a thing. For a little, tiny little uh, instrument or uh, device. Or, it's not that big, yeah. Yeah. 
by to sink that kind of money into it. But I, it's all the testing and the retesting and you know. Uh, uh, so it takes the signal. The camera takes the picture from the drone, the, the device itself, and it sends it to uh, to the rover. Sends it to the rover. Yeah, and then the and rover. Then the Takes sends, it and it sends it back to uh, back to us. Sends it up to the Mars orbiter, and then the Mars orbiter sends it back to us. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and then back to us. So it's now it's it's going one. So it's three different um, crafts that yep. that signal goes to before it comes back to Earth. Yes, yeah, that's right. And even the commands that come up to it to say, okay, we're ready to try this part of it. Uh, uh, Rover, tell Ingenuity to start uh, autonomously doing this, like getting itself ready. And uh, yeah. that message has to come up a few hours ahead of time. Uh, because it has to get there in time, you know, for them to, for, for when they want to do it. But this first yeah. test is just going to be nine or like three meters up and three meters down. So um, it'll be interesting to see if it does happen. And, and like Mike had yeah. mentioned before, the gravity is the one thing that they can't really simulate here on Earth, right? We can simulate yeah. the, the thin atmosphere, but we're, how it's going to land, I mean, if it, if it lands and falls or, you know, we really don't know with, when it's that light, you know, what's going to happen to it. So yeah, it should be But there shouldn't be that much impact to it where it is so light. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and the uh, and and the Martian surface is uh, the gravity supposed to be heavier than ours? No, it's le it's less. Lighter, less. Yeah. It's less. Yeah. yeah. So that, so so it'll be less impact again. Yeah, but it might so bounce it's, on its way it's down. Yeah. Um, those legs that are sticking up, they look like they're uh, like they've got a lot of um, uh, cushion to them. Yeah. For the end of them. Yeah. Did, did you do any research on the legs on the yeah, feet? Yeah, they, yeah, they are they are quite. Wait, uh, like they're extended out this way, and yeah. they're, they are, they do have a bit of a shock absorption in them. So okay, yeah, yeah. 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 I'm not saying that even the the drones that you buy today, uh, you can basically land them, crash them upside down, and they'll spin the props backwards and come back up, and it doesn't even break a propeller. Like yeah. guys are yeah. landing them in water and taking off and everything else. So it would be impressive what NASA can do with this thing. Yeah, yeah I bet you. I mean, just yeah. to, just to know that there's a flight on another planet that that's going to be autonomous as well, yeah. like it's going to decide itself when it's going to, and uh, it like the rover will be looking up at it, taking shots, and then it'll be looking down at the rover, taking pictures. Yeah. And I think yeah. they're they're talking about video, but I'm I mean they did do video of the uh, of the Mars Perseverance landing. Of course, it was coming down from the sky crane. It was looking up at the sky crane, and then the sky crane was looking down at it. So if they can yeah. do that in high def. It just might take longer to get that information because that's all compressed data, right? So that's a lot of data for for video. So they so want to get a couple of pictures first. So does that craft actually go back in under uh, no. the rover? Uh, it, all... it, it has a solar panel so that it can charge itself up, right? That, that, that's right. So that's what it's going to do then. It's going to charge itself up. It's going to stay stationary. It's now a uh, a product, if you will, of Mars. Right. Because, yeah. Right? Yep. So then it's going to charge itself up and then go. So if something ever happened to Rover for some reason, they didn't know what was going on, uh, would they be able to put that machine up and have a look? Not likely because of, because of the, the chain of command to get to the little yeah. machine. It, it's 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 autonomous in the way that it looks at its its safety features and decides if it's going to take off or not. Like it, it does a spin right. up first of all, the blades flat like this, and then right. it says, okay, I'm all I'm all set to go. Then it pitches the blades and the way it goes. But the autonomous part is it up and going around. But it's already been programmed to do like four flights. Uh, the, the the flight information has been programmed into it, but it's going to make okay. decisions on its own because we can't control yeah. it from a joystick from Earth, right? So yeah, it's too yeah. far. And, but they but yeah. they might be able to program or might be able to tell it. I'm not sure if they could tell it to do something different or not. Um, the information yeah. does go to the rover. We send it to the rover. The rover sends it to Ingenuity. So that it's possible, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. But yeah, just it's, it's, it's just, it's just a, I'm sure that they thought about a lot of this stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. But yeah. as we speak about this and you know in this form it just starts you know triggering questions that you wouldn't ask yeah. if you thought on a news show right yeah, absolutely yeah. yeah already the solar panel is getting covered with dust i noticed that in a couple of the shots uh, you know there is dust moving around on mars apparently all the time and it's very light like the the atmosphere is very light very thin so things can move very easily i guess right yeah um but it, but they're saying well as long as they can get the flight up, you know, in four or five days, it shouldn't be a, a hindrance. It's just that it drops down to minus 90 at night, so it's yeah. you know, it needs that time to, to recharge. And yeah. uh, the more dirt it gets on the panels, of course, the more it's going to, you know, affect it. I wonder but, if uh, they factored in uh, the dust storms. 
Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I, I think they're probably thinking too that when the, when the device when it does get lift off, uh, the blades and rotors and, and and it you know flying around is going to help to clear the solar panel itself, right? So, right, yeah, right, yeah. Yeah. Didn't one of the other rovers have dust on the panels and miraculously cleaned itself somehow? Yeah, they did. Yeah, actually, that's why they survived. And that so long, photo right? with a shadow with Bunny wiping it off there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> why did I put a windshield wiper on the top of that? I don't know. Like, you spent eighty-five million dollars on the spacecraft and you can't put a little wiper blade on it. To... Right. <laughs> or you could have you could have the rover come up to it, and, you know, put its arm out and yeah. uh, wipe it off. Here you go. You little yeah. squeegee up there. Yeah, a little squeegee. <laughs> I guess anyway. I could say because it's on the red planet, red rover, red rover. Oh yeah, <laughs> uh, knew that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, welcome everybody on YouTube and Facebook. Thanks for joining us. And that, that's my part of the talk. So we're going to move right now right into uh, Rosanna's fun facts because we didn't get a chance to do that last week, and we want to be sure we cover that this or week. Or the week before. Or the week before. Or the week before. Really? She Thank said you. two weeks out. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, yeah, so it, um, but like I say, this one, this one that we've been uh, waiting on, um, is it's not uh, time sensitive, so. Okay. But, but a good fun fact, nonetheless. Awesome. Let's go. All right. So let me see if I can remember how to do this. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> what would you want with a rabbit? <laughs> yeah, what would a rabbit? Oh, where did it go? I got to find it now. Good golly. Good golly, Miss no, Molly. Molly. Uh, where is she? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Maybe that's why we couldn't uh, do it last week. We started at 7 o'clock, and he still can't find it now. <laughs> <laughs> no. no. It's called preparation for the show. <laughs> I know. I can't believe I can't find it. I know it's here because I've had you gotta it. You got to get a to-do list. A little sticky note on the screen. Should we move ahead with Mike's uh, binocular talk, maybe? Yeah, I do Mike's binocular okay. talk. And right? I can't okay. find it. I don't know where it is. <laughs> 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 We're getting too oh, old. <laughs> well, isn't that something? <laughs> No, seriously, go ahead, Mike. <laughs> God, I'm just pulling up the, trying to find the first slide here. <laughs> what am I looking for? Present now. Uh, window. I want. Mike's but doctor target of the week. Here we go. <clears throat> it keeps changing on me here. <laughs> Will you guys get your act together? Time's ticking. These, these people are wanting, you know, they want the show. You should see by no bud. This is the show. <laughs> Paid my two bits to see the high diving act. I'm going to see the high diving act. <laughs> is, is he up and he, running or he, he's two he's up? He is up. Bino All target right. of the week by Bino Bud. Good enough. Right. I'm going to pin so, that so it'll fill the screen. There we go. This week's Bino target of the week is Mizar and Alcor. You're going to be seeing double. <laughs> so it's uh, two stars. Mizar and Alcor. Or, or Alcor. Uh, two stores forming a naked eye double in the handle of the Big Dipper asterism in the constellation of Ursa Major. Mizar is the second star from the end of the Big Dipper's handle, and Alcor is his fainter companion. The ability to resolve Mizar and Alcor with the naked eye is often quoted as a test of eyesight, even though some people with poor quality eyesight can still see the two stars. But Mizar and Alcor were the first binary star system discovered. That's an interesting tidbit. Yeah. Where to find in the sky? Well, now that it's not getting uh, dark as early, uh, at about 10 o'clock at night, if you were to step outside, face northeast, and look straight up, you would see the constellation Ursa Major. And then from Ursa Major... You look at the, the, the pot of the, the dipper itself, follow the handle back, and it's right here, the second star in on the handle of the Big Dipper. It's pretty easy to find. You may not see the double star with your naked eye right away, but some people will, some people won't. But with binoculars, you'll definitely spot it. And this is what it will look like in a set of 10 by 50 binoculars. It is split, and Mizar might look like it's elongated a little bit. Now, if you were to 
say how big is that compared to the size of the full moon because i've been using the full moon as a comparison it's it's great to see in 10 by 50s this is what the full moon would look like and there would be the split between mizar and alcor so you definitely see the double star in a set of 10 by 50 binos now what are you actually looking at mizar is a double star and then it goes out to alcor so when i said mizar looks like it might be slightly elongated that's because you're looking at uh, a double star as well. So it not only is it Mizar and Alcor, but it's Mizar A and B as well. But if you were to use a telescope, high power, and look really, really close, it's actually a sextuplet. Mizar B is a double, Mizar A is a double, and Alcor is a double. So the six stars all interacting. So that's a single star versus a binary star. <laughs> binocular or binocular. <laughs> <laughs> That's our bino target of the week. Awesome. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I love the cartoons. Yeah. We should do, do a show just on those. Are we saying it wrong now? Is that is that a main? Is that a main? No. A mem? Who? I'm not up on that that internet stuff. They call them no. memes. Mine memes. Memes. Memes? Is that what it's called? Memes? M E M E. Mimi or Mimi, 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 Okay, so now it's time for. There we go. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fun oh. Uh, I can't believe it. I lost the volume. <laughs> this is not a good night for me. Oh, I had, a whole, I, had a, I had a whole week to prepare for this. Yeah, oh, I know, but it, it didn't happen for some reason. No. Oh. All right. There we go. We'll try that again. Okay. Where's your picture? I don't know. Hey, hey. All right. Hey, hello. Welcome back. Get him up there. Yeah, I, it's, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I fumbled it like a bad football player. But uh, you know what? <laughs> You're here. <laughs> and now I'm going to try to do you some, some service of all your great work on this absolutely crazy fun fact. So. Here we go. Okay, so this week, uh, Rosanna writes, um, define definition. It seems to be human nature to list, define, and categorize everything on earthly world, on the earthly world, and also in the worlds beyond. Certainly, it makes it easier to order things on Amazon if you know exactly what the item is called that you need or the pandemic isolation is making you want. <laughs> Well, in astronomy, recently discovered a thing that is defying to be categorized. Actually, two things. Thing one and thing two. <laughs> <laughs> so what you found is that as a mystifying example of in between, not stars, not planets, but two objects, a pair of planet-like orbs. Oh, oh I, I skipped ahead. Sorry about that. Well, an astronomer, no, I'm here. So, <laughs> some 450 light years away, they uh, uh, that aren't bound to any host star and are traveling the void together. Tentatively, they are called brown dwarfs, uh, which in dim, not quite stars that never uh, grew large enough to fuse hydrogen. But this pair are tiny even by brown dwarf standards, and they look more like planets uh, than anything stellar, according to, and her name is Clemens Font Font Fontany. there we go. And I'm gonna show you who she is. So this is the gal that made that claim. So, and she's from the University of Berm in Switzerland, the astronomer who discovered them, that's her. <laughs> the large brown dwarf, of the pair rest on the boundary astronomers use to differentiate stars from planets around 13 times the mass of Jupiter, 
The smaller one weighs in at only eight times the size of Jupiter. But remember, Jupiter is two and a half times larger than any, or sorry, than all of the planets in our solar system combined. So one thing and two thing aren't tiny in that regard. Everything is relative. <laughs> so according to that definition, it, thing one, should be a planet. But if you define that a planet should form around a star, then it's not really a planet either, Fontenive uh, said. She calls the new pair planetary mass brown dwarfs. Now, these objects are found in the constellation uh, Ophiuchus near the celestial equator, and they are about five times farther apart from each other than Pluto is on average from the sun, which means they are just barely a pair. Now, according to uh, Fontenay, the pair seem to have the weakest gravitational connection of any binary discovered thus far, so they don't quite fit that category either. Now, let me just get this down here, and we'll go here. There we go. And I'll make that a little bit bigger. I think everybody knows what this is, but if you don't, you're going to in a second. So, um, so they theorized back in the 1960s that brown dwarfs existed, but he termed them black dwarfs. And the term black dwarf, however, was already in use to refer to a cold white dwarf, also known as a generative dwarf. Now, this picture you're seeing is the image of Sirius, the star. So it's Sirius A and Sirius B. And this picture was taken by the Hubble. Sirius B, which is a white um, dwarf, can be seen as a faint point of light to the lower left of the much brighter Sirius A. So that's there. So this is a really good test. A lot of people try to resolve that little Sirius B. So there are also red dwarf objects. A red dwarf is the smallest and coolest. Let me just get rid of that picture and show you this. There we go. It's the smallest and the coolest temperature-wise, but not socially awesome, <laughs> kind of star uh, on the main sequence. Red dwarfs are by far the most common type of star in the Milky Way at least in the neighborhood of the sun. But because of their low luminosity, individual red dwarfs cannot easily be observed. From Earth, not one star that fits the stricter definitions of a red dwarf is visible to the naked eye. Proxima Centauri is a red dwarf. So in the case you are wondering, the term black dwarf, let me just, whoop, whoop, there we go. Um, if you can, you the black, the term black dwarf is used to refer to a white dwarf that has cooled to the point that it no longer emits significant amounts of light. But at this, but, and this is an important but, since the time required for even the lowest mass white dwarf to cool to this temperature is calculated to be longer than the current age of the universe, these objects are not yet expected to exist. Interesting. Well, then, this is exciting, if also confusing. Black dwarfs don't exist, but are expected to. I couldn't find an estimate as to when, but I suspect it's not going to be in our lifetime. <laughs> White degenerative dwarfs do exist, as do red dwarfs and brown dwarfs. Just so you know, brown dwarfs are not really brown. The colors actually range from red and orange to magenta. And brown dwarfs are also termed failed stars a rather tragic name for, for a category. Fontenay can't really categorize her newly found pair, so for now, they're going to be termed a binary planetary mass system, barely. <laughs> she has determined that they are young, only about 3 million years old, and by the time a brown dwarf is a billion years old, it will have become basically invisible. Only 1,800 brown dwarfs have been identified so far. So you can find the paper uh, by uh, Fontenay uh, that was accepted by the, astro the Astrophysical Journey Letters. And there is a, um, a, a link to that if, if somebody wants it. So let me see if we go back the other way here. So all that reads a bit like science fiction, it really isn't. <laughs> and that is this week's. Rosanna's Fun Fact. Hey! Now hey. oh, I'm going to find my way back to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time. Somebody there suggested you had too much candy tonight, Paul. 
I think I did. I'm sitting here with a whole bag of that stuff. I just said, how can you, how can you have too much candy? doesn't happen. <laughs> I've never heard of it. I can hear you now, but I can't find <laughs> it. Oh, look at the liquor. <laughs> and, that's, and that's nibs. That's not twisted. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's, Super nibs. That's easy stuff to eat. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, from right. here, we're going to go to uh, talk a little bit about collimation. Um, I guess, because we're into 842, so we've got some time. Oh, my goodness. All right. Okay, so I guess it's me again. Yeah. All right. All right, so let me just see if I can get Unless this. Unless you just go to commercial, Paul, we can come back. What's that? We can go to commercial and come back, Dave, if you want. <laughs> no, I'm good. I'm, I'm ready for this. <laughs> if there's no music, I'd have to worry about oh, that. Okay. So. <laughs> All right, so, okay. um, so we're going to talk very briefly on collimation. Um, what I want to do is I want to grab a prop first. Okay. Right. Not one from the Mars forward. <laughs> okay. The reason I want to grab this is because I want to tell you a little bit about collimation. So the reason we talk to, are going to talk about collimation tonight is because we wanted to um, start to do a little bit of a series on uh, getting your telescope ready for the upcoming uh, astronomy season, where that is basically, it's almost, it's pretty much here now, really. Um, you know, the weather's getting a little bit warmer. It's a little more acceptable to be out at night. Once we get through the April showers for the May flowers, then we'll start having clear skies again. And when we do, you want to make sure your telescope is ready to look at those stars without any funny looking stars. <laughs> you want those nice round, sharp little pinpoints to look at. And the way to get that on your telescope um, is by lining up your optics. Now by lining up your optics, what we simply mean is that we want to have what you see in that eyepiece to be in the right position from what goes into the front of the telescope so that you can see it as nice, clear, sharp objects. When that doesn't happen, then we have to do a process called collimation. Collimation is the lining up of optics. That's really what it is. So, um, so tonight I'm going to talk about collimating uh, a Smith Cassegrain telescope. Before I talk about that, I just want to tell you that there's a number of different telescopes out there. Most people out there have either a little refractor telescope that for 99.9% .9 of the world out there does not need collimation. So if you have that type of a telescope, um, basically, um, you're good to go. They are, there is collimatable uh, refractors, but for the most part, you're not going to have to worry about having to do what we're going to talk about on this other telescope. Now, the telescope I'm talking about tonight is called a smith cassegrain telescope, and a smith cassegrain telescope is what they call a compound telescope. And that just simply means that there is a mirror in the front, and there's a mirror in the back, and there's also a lens, but you don't have to adjust the lens. All you have to do is basically adjust the mirror on the front with the mirror on the back so that as that light passes through that, that light path, the light is actually going in the right angle so that it's hitting everything properly. If it doesn't, you're going to have funny kind of comet-like sharp stars all around, or you're going to see things that are bright, and you're going to have all these color aberrations and all kinds of stuff uh, that can go wrong with them if you're not collimated properly. Now, the two things you're gonna to have to collimate are gonna be smith Green telescope, like the one I'm gonna show you. And I think maybe next week, Mike might be doing um, uh, um, uh, Smithsonian telescopes or Dobsonian, which is the same thing. Dobsonian is just a big newt sitting in a, in a, in a cradle. So, uh, but, so Mike will talk about that. Now that's also a popular telescope that a lot of you folks out there probably have as well. So, but a lot of us have these, what we call smith cassegrain telescopes, and they kind of look like this. The whole point, I'm gonna turn my thing up here a little bit to see that, there we go. The whole point behind a smith cassegrain is that it's a very powerful telescope, but because of all the mirrors and stuff in it, it takes what would normally be probably longer than I can stretch my arms apart for focal length, and it makes it into this little tube so that you can carry it around, make it nice and portable, but yet give you all kinds of magnification. So what happens is sometimes from traveling, uh, that kind of stuff, uh, bumping on the roads, going to your dark sky sites, the mirrors will finally knock themselves out of alignment from each other, and then you're going to have to collimate your telescope because your optics aren't lined up. So I'm going to show you uh, some of the things that you will see when this happens. So I'm just going to share my screen here. Uh, over here, that one, plink, and... There we go. So I'm going to show this one first because this is probably what you're going to see more than anything uh, when you look through your eyepiece. 
So when you're looking through your eyepiece, uh, looking up at the sky, looking in a star, if you want to check your collimation to see if it's actually uh, accurate or inaccurate, what you're going to do is you're going to find a nice star, preferably something like Polaris that doesn't move around a lot, because when you're going through this collimation process, every time you make an adjustment, you have to recenter your star. So you want something that's going to stay relatively stable. Polaris is a nice magnitude, I think around three, something like that. And it's a good one to do a collimation on. So when you look at the first circle where it says perfect collimation, what you do is you take your uh, eyepiece, you center it, the star dead center in your eyepiece, and then you take your focuser and you start winding it out so that it's about um, a quarter of, the, of your field of view, of a quarter of the size of your field of view. You're going to get these donut shapes. And that big hole that you see in the center, that donut, that's actually the central obstruction from your mirror that's in the front of your telescope. So what you want is you want that donut to look like an absolutely perfect concentric circle when you're out of focus. And the reason for that is then that means that your mirror in the front, which is that black disc there, is actually in line with the, with the total mirror um, in the back. If you look to the left, this one over here, or to the right rather, you'll see that that donut is all off to one side. So what's happened here is that mirror uh, has gotten knocked out of collimation, so it's not pointing where exactly it should be so that you get nice pinpoint stars. If you see this, you are going to have to collimate your telescope. So let me just show you here. So there's, uh, let me see if I can find one here. Did I, take, did I take one? No, okay, I'll show you on my scope in a second. Yeah, there's one there. So here's a picture of the front of a telescope, uh, Schmidt-Cassegrain, and that thing that you see in the center with the three little screws on it, Paul? that basically, yeah. Sorry, uh, we're not seeing your photos. Just a second. That's me. I got you pinned. So can we? There, there. Okay, I'm gonna pin your photo. Okay, can you see it? Can Did you not see the last no, photo yeah. slide? Sorry. Yeah. Can you go back? Yep. Was okay. So there's where we started, folks. Sorry. Great. So the okay. circles that I was talking to you about, and you were kind of dreaming about, look like this. <laughs> <laughs> So that perfect collimation that we talked about, about having that donut, that black hole right in the center, which is the obstruction from your mirror, uh, your, your secondary mirror in the front of your telescope, that's what you want. You want that dead center with, compared to the rest of the rings. And how you get it to look like that is you find a star, you focus on the star so it's nice and tight, you put it right in the dead center of your telescope, and then you take your focuser and you start making it so that it goes way out of focus. Once it's out of focus, it'll start getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You want it to fill about 25% of the field of view in your eyepiece. So if you're, you know, when you're looking through your, your, your uh, eyepiece there, you want to make sure that you've got about 25% of it filled with this and in the center. If you see perfectly centric circles like this, and there's no distance or difference between how thick it is from the center here to the outer edge on this side, versus how thick it is from here to the outer edge on this side, then you know you are correctly collimated. If you see, however, that your concentric, your uh, secondary mirror obstruction is over here, and as you can see, I'm very tiny on this side, and I'm extremely wide on this side, that means I'm a I'm out of collimation. So what's happened is something has knocked that mirror out of line to where it should be, and you, need, and you will need to collimate your telescope. Fear not, collimation is not a hard thing. So I want to show you the picture that I was going to start with, which is right here. So if you have a smith cassegrain telescope, a lot of you people do. And uh, like if you have a 6SE, a 4SE, an 8SE, um, those are smith cassegrain telescopes. And the collimation we're talking about tonight uh, relates to those. So if you look at the front of your telescope, you're going to see on the front where your um, secondary mirror is, there's three little screws. Those three little screws are the things you're going to have to adjust to get your um, secondary mirror back in the position that it needs to be. Now, so um, let me just see if there's something here I can show you. There are other ways to collimate. This is the one I'm showing you this one because if you look up collimation, you might start seeing a bunch of stuff like this. And this is using a whole tech laser collimator which is way more complicated. You're not going to be doing this because you're not going to want to go buy one because they're about 700 bucks. So, but if you see this, don't pay attention to this. This is not the type of collimation we're going to do tonight. Just so that if you go online, you don't get confused and say, well, he didn't talk about this. 
this is a whole other uh, platform to do collimation. So now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to show you a little, whoops, let me, I should be able to put that over here. There we go. So this one here is, um, is a collimation process that was written by a RASC member in the London um, uh, RASC um, uh, uh, office or whatever you call it out there by a fellow named Rick Saunders. And this is a really, really good thing that you can actually go to um, the London RASC uh, Astronomy Club and this fellow named Rick Saunders, just look him up and he's got a whole section on how to collimate an SCT. So basically this one pager is really all you're gonna need to know. So it just says basically that smith cassegrain telescopes generally keep the collimation quite well, if not mistreated by when they come time it, uh, that every SCT owner's life that they're going to have to realign their secondary mirror. So how you do it is really is if you if you see this and we showed you on the earlier slides uh, when the collimation is in and when it's out, we can see that this first slide that collimation is out because that circle is not in the center. So you're going to say to yourself, okay, so you show me three screws, but how do I know which one to adjust? Hmm. Well, what you do is you take your finger and you take it and you put it in front of the telescope and you point towards one of the screws. Now, on this illustration you see right here, I'm going to see if I can blow that up for you. There we go. What he's done here is he's taken his finger and he's pointed at one of the screws. And this just happens to be the one that he needs to adjust because this is the one that he's too close to, right? If he points out one of the other screws, he may be pointing down here. And he may see that this is what his finger is, that little gray smear. That's is actually his finger. You can do it with a screwdriver. You can do it with whatever you want, just to put a, a basically a, an obstruction in front of the light going in the telescope. And then that's what you do. So once you've got that, then you go ahead and you do the process, which I'm going to show you in a minute, which is basically adjusting those three screws. And eventually you're going to end up with your um, donut right dead center again. And once you've got that done, you actually are completely collimated. Now I'm going to stop sharing, or I'm going to try to, and I'm going to go live here. And, and Chris, I'll get you to pin me. And I want to show you in the front what those where those screws are. So if you can see my telescope there, you guys see that okay? Am I on the wrong page? No, it looks good. Should it be there? Oh, we got you, Paul. Yep. You got me now? Yeah, all good. Yep. Or should I be over here? Pretty okay. as ever. We, we can see you. Okay, good. Okay, so this is the front of the smith cassegrain telescope. So, again, you've got that glass in the front. Do not touch the glass. You don't want <laughs> fingerprints on that glass. Okay, so do not touch the glass when you're doing this. But on the front of that, that glass, that's actually the lens that actually does a bit of correction. So as the light goes down way into the back of that big mirror down the back, it mounts that mirror, sends it back up onto the secondary mirror. If you've never seen a secondary mirror, I will show you one just so you know what you're dealing with. So this is a secondary mirror. This is what you're actually going to be lining up. So this mirror is what basically the light comes through, goes into this scope here, down to that big mirror in the back, bounces back up onto this mirror, and then this mirror sends it back down. There's a little baffle tube down in there. So this is what you're actually going to be lining up, the secondary mirror. Now, you're also going to notice that uh, on the front of it, I've got three knobs, and they're not screws. And the first thing I would recommend to anybody is if you can buy yourself what set they call bob knobs, and they're just little knobs that you put in the place of these screws that you have to do a screwdriver with. The reason being is when you're trying to collimate this on your own, trying to go back and forth and sticking a screwdriver in the front, make the adjustment, walking back to the telescope is a pain in the foot. You don't want to have to do that. So when you put these little screws in, you take one screw out and you screw in one of these bobs knobs. Take another screw out, put another one of these bob knobs in. So now when I make the adjustments on this telescope, I just have to turn this knob. That's all I have to do. So once I discover which of those three screws that need the adjustment, and I do that by, and I'm going to show you, get this mirror back in first. There we go. And I'm just going to lock that back in place so it doesn't fall out on me. No, Paul, not all smith Castle greens have that secondary mirror come out like that. So if somebody's no. got an older one, don't take it apart. <laughs> right, yeah. And there, I, I just showed you that on mine because I want to show you what a secondary mirror was. Right. But your telescope has to have uh, fast star capability 
In other words, the ability to have a hyperstar in it in order for you to be able to remove it like I did with mine. Most telescopes that don't that don't have the hyperstar capability or the fast star capability, you're not going to be able to pull the mirror up. But you don't have to. You don't have to. Knobs in, you don't have to take it out. You just you can do it right inside the scope. Okay, so basically that test that you're doing when you want to see which screw it is that that's the, that uh, that your star is out of center on, you just put your finger like that. And if I do that and it goes to a very wide part of it. I know that's not the right one. I want to find the one that's got that, that real tight, tight edge. So then I'm going to try this one. I'll put my finger there. And what you're going to be looking for is in the back of your telescope. Uh, that back one. You're going to be looking in your eyepiece. So you're going to be pointing to a star. You're going to be looking in your eyepiece. And then you're going to see... Um, okay, there's my star, then I'm going to go to my focuser, and I'm going to turn that focus knob until I see that star is out of focus, and it's going to be nice and big in the, in the, in the eyepiece. And if I see that it's out, then I know I have to adjust. Now, because the smith caster grains are so short, I'm able to reach the front of the scope, put my finger there, find the one that needs to be adjusted first. Once I've found it, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to turn that screw, or if I have a somewhat screwdriver, I'm going to make that adjustment then i'm going to recenter my scope because as soon as you make that adjustment the star is going to be off center so you have to recenter the star and then you're going to find out how far that you came along so that little tiny edge it's all squeezed out i've actually opened that up more but did i open it up enough so that it matches the same width on the other one if not i'm going to go ahead and i'm going to make another adjustment i'm going to recenter my scope again and then if I see that that hole, that donut is in the is centered, like I showed you on the illustration, that's it. That's all there is to it. You are now collimated. And that's all you have to do. And I, I know that's a quick run through on the scope, but it's really that simple. You get out under the night sky, you find Polaris, which is a good star to use because it doesn't move around. It's bright enough. Focus on the star. Um, turn your focuser so that it's, uh, again, blowing the star right up. Look for that central obstruction, that secondary mirror. If that is dead center, then you're, you're good to go. Put it back in focus and then enjoy the rest of the night. If it's not in center, then go ahead and put your finger up there, find out which screw that's got the tightest uh, band around that mirror. And then uh, once you find that out, make the adjustment, look in your eyepiece, recenter the star again. You have to recenter it every time. Once you recenter, and then as, as that gets into the center, once that's done, collimation's over. And that's it. So that's basically collimating a Smith Cassegrain telescope. We've done tons of them. Every time we go to star parties, we do tons of them. They're so, so simple to do. So that's my story. Awesome, Paul. Yeah, that is. Um, and an SCT is a very popular telescope, as you mentioned. And yeah. it is most most important that's one of the most important things right there is to have your telescope collimated properly you're going to get a whole lot better image uh, mm -hmm. things aren't going to be fuzzy out of focus and stars are going to be pinpoint and if you're going to consider astrophotography down the road you're going to really want all that as well so great it's thanks paul <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thanks paul and next week we're going to have mike's going to talk about uh, uh collimating a reflector telescope <laughs> yes he is whether he likes it or not <laughs> Because we're running out of time. We're at 9 o'clock right now. I just want to bring back a couple of photos. I only had a couple of photos to share tonight. But okay. I do want to remind people that uh, you can send your photos into Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com. And we love getting them. And we love sharing them. So, uh, Or send them into my Facebook page. I like to do uh, get them that way too. So let's uh, just open up my uh, folder here. Just got a couple here from Stefan Picard I'm going to share. And then we're going to call it an evening. So we'll go in here. And Stefan sent this one in. Uh, he said, uh, hi, Chris, a uh, couple of shots from Saturn from Friday and Saturday morning. Uh, Friday was a little bit more challenging with some clouds and fog, probably attributed to the darker tone in the image compared to Saturday's capture. Sadly, nothing really presentable yet of Jupiter, but um, that'll come. Don't worry, uh, Stefan, you're on the right path. You guys able to see that? Yes, looks yes, great. And we're going to hop over here to another image that he has as well. 
Great, Stefan. So you're on the path, pal. You just keep going. Take your time, patience, and uh, we'll expect more from you. A couple more next week will be good. <laughs> Uh, Renat uh, sent in this one. She said this was an unknown star that she had found, and she brought up a um, app here that she had followed. So he has, she, it was in Scorpius. I believe she was probably looking at Antares. I'm not sure because she didn't circle which one it was, but I was waiting to get some information back from her on that. But she did provide a poem for it, but I don't know if we're going to have time to write, read that tonight or not. I don't think we are. But I'm going to ask Renat if she wanted to share that with me here, um, and she puts it up on her website. Uh, you can go to renatart.com and find out uh, more about her fantastic work. Yes. She does some awesome paintings. Okay, we're at the end of our program. Wow. wow. Oh, there, there was a question I saw. Somebody wants okay. to know, can you call late in the daytime? And uh, Mike answered it, but I want to be a little more specific to somebody. Um, you can get uh, an artificial star. I've got one here somewhere, but it's just a little tiny flashlight. And it's got a whole bunch of little tiny holes punched in the front of it. And it shines pretty bright, but they're really tiny. So you can mount that to uh, a tripod, drag it, you know, about 50 to 75 feet away from your telescope. And then you can, and, but make sure that your telescope is in the shade so that you can actually see this. And, uh, and then you can go ahead and do that same collimation process as if you're looking at a star in the sky. Awesome. Thanks, uh, oh, you can buy them for uh, about $25 off. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Brian Foote was asking you a little bit about uh, just starting in this interesting and fantastic world. What would be a good starter scope in the five to eight hundred dollar range? And Brian, that's the magic question. We get asked that <laughs> all the time. Um, and I wouldn't suggest buying a telescope right off the bat. I would probably suggest binoculars first. If you're just getting started in the hobby and you don't want to get frustrated, spending five to eight hundred dollars is a major investment. And you may find that uh, you know you don't like being underneath the the, uh, the night sky as much as you might think you might <laughs> because you spend hours and hours and hours out there steadily standing there at the eyepiece uh, freezing sometimes and everything gets wet and you're looking at cloudy skies a lot there's a lot of frustration that can go along with it but um, we really recommend binoculars first because that gets you familiar with the night sky go outside learn the constellations learn where a few of them are you know where the big dipper is you know where Orion is start finding out where the other ones are and then finding out uh, what they're like to use binoculars. Sit outside for a half hour, hour, uh, looking at the Milky Way. There's a number of things you can see with binoculars, a great tool. Uh, $50 will get you started in the, in the cheap set, 10 by 50s, great start uh, with them. The Pleiades are available. Uh, Jupiter and his moons are available. The moon itself is absolutely fantastic in binoculars. Start down that road and then join an astronomy club like ours. Um, and then from clubs like ours, you can actually borrow telescopes, a lot of them. We have telescopes to loan out. Um, you take it away for a month and you bring it back and then you say, well, that's not really what I'm looking for. I'm looking for something else. So we have two or three that we can lend out uh, that way. Um, and then talk to people like ourselves who can you know, help you uh, make your decision. But when you're about ready to make that five to $800 decision and you've, you've got some more information behind you, then certainly we're able to, you know, to offer some introductory type telescopes for five to eight hundred dollar range. You're probably looking at, to my opinion, an eight inch Dobsonian telescope. These guys here, though, would have different opinions. So um, my experience with them is that because it's a manual type telescope, you can move it around the sky easier. I like that idea, of getting you started in that approach. But others may suggest a refractor or an SCT telescope. We would all have our, our favorites, right? To me, something like this little guy behind me, this little tabletop, is a perfect little start for about 350 bucks. Uh, portable, lightweight, easy to move around. Um, but again, we'll all have different opinions. But the best way to get started really is to try to set up binoculars first. Cheap investment. Uh, you'll keep them for your lifetime. You'll never have to worry about replacing them. And they'll always be with you, no matter if you buy a telescope or not. So hopefully that helps uh, a little bit, Brian. Uh, I can just quickly add to that, Chris. Yeah. You're not going to see a Hubble picture in a telescope. Right. Don't buy a telescope expecting <laughs> that you're going to see a Hubble picture. You're going to see a smudge. <laughs> and if you buy a more powerful telescope, you're going to see a bigger smudge. <laughs> and astrophotography but, is going to cost you yeah. a lot of money to get into. Um, it's not a very cheap, Paul. <laughs> astrophotography? No. Okay. So I wouldn't no. recommend starting with astrophotography. Astrophotography is great once you start to learn the night sky and learn your way around and what you want to capture and stuff. But uh, it takes hours and 
many hours sometimes to capture just that one uh, photograph and then all the processing that it takes afterwards and it can get very expensive. The other side is don't look for a new scope right away. There is a lot of really good used equipment out there because astronomers mm -hmm. take care of their gear. And you'll right. find that you can save a lot of money by purchasing something that's you know been used. Don't Absolutely. shy away from that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's go sign off, I guess. <laughs> It's my part again. So, uh, in closing, then again, uh, a special thanks once again for all your continued support out there. We really appreciate you uh, joining us, and we really appreciate you sharing uh, the show too when you have the opportunity. Uh, thanks again, of course, to Rosanna for her continued contributions to our show. Rosanna, we really appreciate all your efforts out there in helping us uh, put the show together. Uh, we also like to thank our uh, great people at Astronomy Plus for sponsoring our program for us. Uh, and uh, remember, too, we do love getting your photos, so you can send them into Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com, or you can send them into my Facebook page. I'd love to get them there as well, and we uh, love to show them on the broadcast. We're also looking for suggestions for future shows or for future topics. Actually, uh, we can look at Paul Crowder here from the UK who had suggested our binocular target of the week segment, so we've actually made it a segment now, which is great. Um, uh, so again, if you have any ideas for future shows, please let us know uh, by, at the same address, Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com. We also ask that if you enjoyed the program tonight and you joined us from YouTube, uh, please consider giving us a like and subscribing to our channel. And then also please uh, let your family and friends know too that we are here every Sunday night at the same time to uh, help educate and entertain you and maybe give you a few laughs. Well, we'll get a few laughs anyway um, <laughs> about, about the night sky. So for now then, from uh, Mike and Paul and I, uh, stay safe, everyone out there, please. Uh, we, we do wish you all very clear skies, and we hope to see you again here next week. And remember, as we like to say, guys, keep your scopes. Point it up. Point it up. Great. And yeah. cue the music. Another one. <laughs> there he goes. <laughs>